Hi, Grandma here, and we're reading the book, Adam on the Road. First thing I want you to do is I want you to look at this picture. Can you tell by this picture that this does not happen today, that this happened a long time ago? What makes you think that? Is it because he is wearing what looks like a skirt? Is it because he has a harp on his back? Also, I want you to notice that it has this gold shield here. This means that this is a Newbery Award winner. Every year, um, all the children's books that are published, uh, they pick the best book of the year. And in, I think it was 1949, uh, this was chosen as the best book of the year. All right. Now, um, if we read this, it's a bit of an introduction. A road, a road's a kind of holy thing, said Roger the minstrel to his son, Adam. That's why it's a good work to keep a road to repair, like giving alms to the poor and tending the sick. It's open to the sun and wind and rain. It brings all kinds of people in all parts of England together, and it's a home to a minstrel, even though he may, be, may happen to be sleeping in a castle. And Adam, though only 11, was to remember his father's words when his beloved dog Nick was stolen and Roger had disappeared and Adam found himself traveling along with the same great roads, searching the fairs and market towns for his father and his dog. Well, that tells us a lot. That tells us it's about a boy who's 11 years old, who his dog Nick is stolen and his dad has disappeared. One of the things I really like about this particular edition, and I hope your edition has it also, is it has a map. And uh, so this is going to be a, a book that takes place in a lot of different places in England. Um, and I will be able to follow along on this map. Um, and here is the title page. That's what this is called. And you see the dog and the harp. And it's a story of minstrels. And a minstrel is a person who entertains people, sometimes in a castle, like in this picture here. You can see here is a minstrel with his harp. And I think it's probably Adam. And here you can see somebody down here is listening to him. They didn't have television, they didn't have movies, but what they had were people who told stories and sang songs. And sometimes they did juggling and other things as well. And those were called minstrels. Our first chapter today is called Adam, and I'm going to begin reading. After a May as gray and cold as December, June came in, the year of 1294, sunny and warm and full of birds and blossoms and all the other happy things the songs praise May for. So 1294, let me see, that is more, that is, about over 700 years ago. Adam Quatermain, who had been looking for his father ever since Easter, thought that now he would surely come. Every morning when he rolled out of his bed in the long dormitory where the schoolboy slept, he said to himself, today he's coming, I know it. And every night, disappointed but not daunted, he put himself to sleep, making up stories about how his father would come the next day. So we have a good setting. It's June, it's 1294, we're in England, uh, and they are minstrels, and Adam is at a school, uh, living in a dormitory with other boys. Sometimes he made him come just at the end of choir practice, sometimes at the beginning of the lesson in grammar, sometimes in the middle of dinner when the boys are, when the boys ate their meal, meat and pottage in silence while a master read aloud in Latin, from the lives of the saints. However, Adam's stories began. They all ended with Roger the minstrel taking Adam right out of school. Across the courtyard, courtyard, they would go striding, Adam with his own harp over his shoulder and his father's viol under his arm. Through the gateway they would pass and over the river to the highway that led to London and all the wide free world. Now, do you have any questions that you would like to know about? I have one question. 
Why is Adam at a school and he doesn't know when his dad is going to arrive? Now remember, this is before cell phones and before email and text messages. So people sometimes had to learn patience when they were waiting for others. This was a famous school that the monks kept in the Abbey of St. Alban, but Adam had had enough of it. Five long months ago, his father had left him there while he himself went to France to the minstrel school held in Lent every year at Cambrai, where he would learn new romances to tell to the lords and ladies of England. So now we know what happened to his dad. And Lent is over because Easter's over. This is June. He should have been back by now. Roger Quartermain was no ordinary minstrel picking up an uncertain penny, telling rough yarns and in yards and marketplaces, filling in gaps in his memory with juggling and tumbling and piping, as the poorer sort did, meaning other minstrels were less gifted. He could play the viol. He could chant long romances in, in French about King Alessander or Charlemagne and his knights or the British king, Arthur, and the search for the Holy Grail. He was welcome at manor houses and at great feasts and castles and everywhere people gave him rich gifts, a length of cloth for a surcoat, a purse full of silver pennies or a gold clasp to fasten his mantle. He went attended boy by a boy to carry his viol and to sing with him when there were songs in the tale or harp a little in the interludes and that boy from his eighth birthday till his 11th last February had been Roger's son, Adam. So Adam watched eagerly for his father and talked endlessly about him to the other boys in school. He always spoke of him as Roger the Minstrel, as if everyone must have heard of him. And if he was a little cocky about being the son of such a man, they forgave him. They liked Adam because he was tousle-headed, snub-nosed, wide-mouthed, square-jawed, because his gray eyes were honest and twinkling, because he sang so well and knew so many stories, and because, though he boasted about Roger, he had a humble enough opinion of himself. They were to watch for Roger, too, and they all expected him from Adam's description to be as handsome as Earl Gilbert, who came sometimes to the Abbey, but kinder, as brave as the king, but younger, and as grand as the abbot himself, but more comfortable. Three things Adam had to comfort him while the good June days went slowly to waste. His harp, his friend Perkin, and his dog Nick. His harp was a small harp at the time, which he carried slung by a thong over his shoulder. His father had taught him to play it when he was a very little boy, living up in the north in a stone house in the shadow of York Minster. Here at the Abbey School, he kept it on the shelf at the head of his bed. On rainy days, when they had free times in the hall after the long hours of lessons, the boys would send him to get it, and he would pluck its strings and tell what he could remember of the tales he had heard from Roger the Minstrel. At first, the boys from the Midlands made fun of his northern dialect, but he turned to French a few times and silenced them. So the Midlands is in the, the middle part of England, but Adam and his father are from the northern part of England, which would be a little bit more Scottish sounding. Not many of these sons of Franklins and Burgesses knew the language of the court folk. They didn't know French, so they were pretty impressed that he knew French. Or he would sing the verses of a song they all knew and they would join in on the refrains. Sometimes they would make up more stanzas on their own. The masters didn't like it very well, for the church officially disapproved of minstrel's tales. If they heard him, they would stop him or make him tell stories about the saints instead but oftener they just pretended not to hear him. His stories were about courtesy and chivalry, never the rude fab blow making mock of holy things that the poor sort of, sort of minstrels told. Perkin, his friend who slept in the cot next to him was a thin, dark haired boy with a high nose and an intense brooding look in his brown eyes. He looked a little like a hawk, except when he smiled. 
Then his white teeth would flash and his whole face would light up. He was a year older than Adam and a great deal farther on in learning. He was looking forward to going to the university at Oxford. I shall study law, he whispered once to Adam, and someday I'll be the chief advisor to the king, like Walter Langton. He started a poor man, you will see. Perkins' father was a plowman in Ewillim, you me, maybe, I don't know that. And Perkin would have had to be a plowman too if it had not been for the parish priest. He first taught Perkin his letters and then persuaded his father to let him go on and take as much learning as he could. It would be a good deal, the priest thought. The plowman had to pay a fine to the Lord of the manor to set his son free and the parish priest had to persuade his brother, who was a monk at St. Albans, to make some special effort to get Perkin into the Abbey School. Altogether, several people had been put to considerable trouble about Perkin's education, which made Perkin very serious, till Adam came. Adam and Perkin had been fast friends since they first saw each other. The master had lifted Perkin by the belt from the table when he was bent over a parchment and said, in Latin, for all their talk in school was in Latin, which was hard for Adam at first. Here's a new boy, show him around and see that he doesn't get into trouble. As it turned out, Adam soon got Perkin into trouble through his dog, Nick. Perkin hadn't minded. He was rather pleased after having been so good and serious for so long to swagger a bit over his misdoings and show that he too could take a beating without flinching. The dog Nick was a red spaniel with long silky ears and a tail that never stopped wagging so long as he was with Adam. He had followed at Adam's heels since he was a round wriggling ball of puppy small enough to walk underneath the other dogs without stooping. He had slept with Adam. He was warm and soft in bed on cold nights and had eaten some of whatever Adam had to eat. He was happy or tired or sad according as Adam was happy or tired or sad. His brown eyes were constantly on Adam's face and he went to great lengths to please his young God and master. He even learned a few tricks to do for crowds in the marketplace or at the fair, though he was not one of those meager, scrounging, anxious, performing dogs anymore than Roger was the wrong kind of minstrel. More than once, Adam and Perkin had met, smuggled Nick into school and tried to keep him hidden in their beds, but he would come out and wag his tail at the master, and he made so much trouble for them that in the end they had to give up the idea. An old woman across the river kept him, and Adam paid her out of the dwindling store of pennies that Roger had left him. Every saint's day and holiday, he went to see Nick to play with him and take him for walks over the fields. And if it had not been for his harp and Perkin and Nick, Adam could hardly have endured the long time of waiting for Roger to come back from France. So that's the end of chapter one. Chapter two is called Nick, and we have a picture here. And it's not a picture of Nick the dog, but it's a picture of Adam, who is the blonde, shorter one with a wider face and a quick smile, and his friend Perkin, who is the tall, thin, dark, a year older than um, Adam is. So I'm going to stop reading there for now, and um, we'll continue the next time. Bye-bye.